Okay, uh, so what I'm going to do today is basically, uh, since you are doing uh, Monte Carlo, which is a lattice, uh, you're doing lattice Mon Monte Carlo as in model simulations. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you today is give you a brief introduction to off lattice Monte Carlo simulations as well. And the hope is that uh, it will help you to understand the Monte Carlo method better. So whatever I'm going to talk today, uh, is uh, not part of the syllabus, which means that you don't have to implement it. But this is just a lecture or a discussion, whatever you want to call it. And I think this will help you to, though you will be implementing uh, Lattice Monte Carlo on the Ising model, uh, the hope is that this discussion today will give you an idea about uh, uh, the potential of uh, Monte Carlo simulations, which is used in many other cases as well okay uh, and it will basically help you develop insight and uh, let you know uh, about the power of monte carlo simulations okay so what i'm going to uh, do today i have to share the screen as well okay i'm presenting my screen uh, now, can you see control L? Can you see my screen? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so please do respond because it's very difficult to uh, talk to a blank uh, screen. So basically, I'll be discussing off lattice Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so basically, uh, the particles can move. Uh, away from a lattice, it can move in continuum space. And I'm going to discuss Monte Carlo simulation for a bead spring polymer model. So what is a bead spring polymer model? I shall of course come to it. But uh, first let me tell you that for a physicist, uh, a polymer uh, of course uh, is a chain of identical uh, monomers. But we don't often consider the, all the detailed chemistry when we talk about polymers. What we are typically talking about is we are treating a polymer more as a uh, object with multiple degrees of freedom. Uh, why so? Uh, basically, because a polymer is a, a monomers connected by springs. So we consider so we don't consider all the chemistry, hydrogen, carbon, or all those chemical bonds. We are looking at at a polymer as a set of beads, beads is these spherical objects, and they are connected by springs to the next monomer, which is this bead again. So it's just a spherical uh, object, uh, and that in turn is connected by a spring. So basically each, this has a degree of freedom, suppose three, and then if it, since it's connected, then if you specify theta and phi, the angle, then uh, the position of this is uh, also fixed right i mean you know its position so these are so these are essentially objects uh, so the degree of freedom for this one and this one and this one and this one uh, so for for the physicist a polymer is a object with many degrees of freedom and each uh, and basically a polymer chain can take various conformations. Why can it take various conformations? That's corresponding to each conformation is corresponding to a statistical microstate. And uh, basically each conformation corresponds to one microstate and by taking different conformations as a single object, but many degrees of freedom, it is able to explore phase space. And a polymer is an object in that case, with a huge amount of entropy. So that is the perspective from where physicists look at polymers. And they look at very generic properties. So when, when you have such bead spring models, so beads are these spheres connected by springs, then you are essentially losing out a lot of the chemistry. And that is intentional because you are uh, one is interested more in the very generic properties of objects with many degrees of freedom. 
okay so here you don't ask uh, ki what does this polymer what is the melting point of this po uh, polymer Th those are not the re relevant question you will uh, typically look at statistical physics uh, type of questions so the first step a uh, polymer is also looked at as a random walk actually so where each of these uh, bonds springs if you like so these springs are representing bonds so then each of these uh, is basically a step in uh, 3d space so basically the polymer statistics is very similar to a random walk statistics except in a random walk um, a particle i mean if you are taking a step you can you can come back in but if you come back so if this was one step and this was the second step but instead if it came back so this particle would sit uh, on top of this which is not allowed so here a polymer statistics can be looked at as a self avoiding random walk so that each site cannot be occupied by another monomer you cannot come back in terms of a random walk you cannot come back and sit on a uh, a site of a previous step okay so this is how beach spring uh, uh, so this is the perspective of uh, uh, polymer for uh, physicists now i won't talk more of polymer physics because uh, the aim of this lecture is more to give an introduction of how would you do a monte carlo now, a polymer uh, or such an object is typically in a background fluid as a consequence of which each of these uh, beads, each of these monomers are doing diffusive motion uh, held to the constraint that it has to be connected uh, with other monomers. So it can move around in space due to diffusion as long as it maintains the connectivity with other particles yeah so if they move around in space what is going to happen it is again going to change conformation access different microstates so it will have a huge amount of entropy so polymers is basically will go from one uh, microstate to the other one conformation to the other and thereby um, access different microstates due to entropic reasons okay so this is the background this is the background but now uh, let's talk more of the model and how you would do uh, the monte carlo for that i need to go a bit more into gory details as i already said uh, oh so there's a spelling mistake it should be polymer ly so the way faces consider is there are these spherical particles okay and they are connected by springs to the next particle now if you have a spring spring is something like a harmonic potential okay uh, and the so, and this chain goes on and on now you could also have two different kinds of monomers with two different properties and here uh, just uh, i have represented uh, one by uh, whatever this white monomer and another by green monomer and the property or the interaction uh, of these monomers could be different uh, and of course that the difference in these monomers would be incorporated by having uh, different interaction potentials okay but uh, we are not going into all of that uh, different uh, monomers and so on and so forth we will consider only one kind of monomer but in principle you can have uh, uh, other attributes uh, for uh, different attributes for different monomers okay so there's and so the so so we shall consider for this monte carlo class only one kind of uh, particle i mean you could have a different radius or you could have a charge or so on and so forth but here we will uh, consider the simplest uh, model which will have a bead and 
connected by springs and no other interaction in in general you can have many other interactions like charge or hydrophobicity and so on and so forth and that will change the number of conformations which are accessible to the polymer so or to, or to, to, to the degree of freedoms if you like so now as the polymer chain is uh, basically taking different conformations why would they take different conformations because each of these uh, monomers can undergo diffusive motion but while taking confer um, while taking different conformations like this if by chance a bead diffuses and uh, tries to touch some other bead uh, then uh, there will be a repulsive force. Um, a repulsive force will act and then it will basically move away. Right? So this such a conformation will uh, go. So the, these two particles have moved away and they have separated. Now the question is of course, how do we uh, model all of this? Spring is of course very easy. Uh, but how do we model the separation and so on and so forth? We, we will come to that. So that's to a potential, of course. So uh, there will be change in uh, conformation due to repulsion as well. Uh, and there is diffusive motion. So, so how do repulsion or this spring work? Now, in the bead spring model, cons considering only spring interaction and bead uh, repulsion. Now, suppose this is the schematic of a bead spring polymer uh, and each of the spring has suppose length e as a certain length one let's suppose okay now so now this is a spring and this is a spring and now if this monomer moves due to diffusive motion such that the spring becomes more stretched it becomes more than its mean length right so then there would be a higher spring energy so there would be a because the spring is stretched there would be a higher energy and in monte carlo you would know that if a system goes to a microstate with the higher energy the probability of accessing that microstate decreases right so we have to incorporate that we will have to incorporate that into the monte carlo simulation and we'll talk about it now if however this this particle moves this particle moves in such a manner such that its position has changed but the length of the spring has not changed so this is a different conformation this particle has moved from here to here so that the length of the spring remains the same right uh, but its position has changed then remember then it will have the same energy as before right so this microstate this conformation is equally probable as this one but this conformation with a more stretched spring has a higher energy as a higher energy and lesser probability of access as per your statistical physics Boltzmann distribution so in the bead spring model of a polymer as where we are looking at the statistical physics of uh, multi degree uh, multi uh, an object with multi uh, multiple degrees of freedom there is a higher energy for spring stretch if the monomers move if the monomers move so that the relative distance between the monomers becomes higher than the average length of the spring so there would be a consequence of spring stretch and that would have a higher energy or if the monomers move so that the spring becomes compressed it becomes smaller than the average length of the spring so there would be a spring compression and since we are modeling by a harmonic interaction a spring interaction so that would also cost higher energy so, so such microstates will be less accessible and if two beads so while diffusing around while these monomers are moving around right 
uh, if there's an overlap of the bead, if two beads overlap, then there would be some repulsion, and that again would have higher energy. But on the other hand, if these polymer changes conformation so that angle is changed, angle between bonds is changed, uh, keeping spring, spring length the same, then there is no energy change. Right? There, there will be completely no energy change and that, that microstate will be equally accessible. Okay, so how, how does one do that? Uh, so how does one, uh, um, so suppose this, uh, you have you have the positions of all the monomers defined, okay? Now suppose this monomer, this monomer uh, moves from here to where this black, uh, uh, black circle is. So suppose this monomer has undergone a motion, okay? Uh, in in such a way so that this spring and this spring gets stretched. So previously the energy uh, of the, uh, of these springs was suppose EI and EI plus one, this spring, and because of the motion of this monomer from here to here, now the spring uh, this is more stretched suppose, and as a consequence the energy uh, of this spring becomes E i dash and this spring becomes E dash i plus one, these two. So then because of this conformation change, the total energy change would be E i dash, this energy plus this energy minus this energy plus this energy and that would be delta E. Now in Ising model, when you make a spin flip, you calculate how much energy change has taken place and whether you accept that uh, step, uh, flip in spin, you access as per Boltzmann probability. Here, the corresponding thing is, you don't have spins here, you have particle positions or bead positions and you give it a random displacement, you make it move and you correspondingly calculate the new energies and then the energy differences and that now is delta E and then you decide whether that change in position is allowed or not. Okay. So similarly in the next step what you could also do is uh, uh, from if the monomer was already here right and it suppose moved opposite the reverse motion from here it moved here then there would be a energy suppose decrease so delta e will be negative suppose and then again you can ask whether that trial step will be accepted or not so just as in ising model uh, monte carlo if there was a delta e if the delta E was such that there is a, so, so due to the motion, due to a motion of a particle, the delta E was such that it led to an increase in energy, then you would accept that conformation change with probability e to the power minus delta E by KBT, which is the so-called Boltzmann factor, just as you are doing in the case of the Ising model uh, spin, but if delta E is negative, so delta E is such that the conformation energy decreases, there's a decrease in energy, then you always accept this conformation change. And this is the principle of Metropolis uh, biased uh, Monte Carlo. And why uh, such a principle is there, that is actually uh, discussed right at the end of the last Monte Carlo lecture. So where does this rule come in? So that is also discussed, but that's at the end. But anyway, in terms of algorithm, that is all that you have to do. So you, what you do is, uh, 
calculate the difference in energy and depending upon whether the energy is increasing if it increases then accept that conformation change or position change you're not uh, by i mean you're just changing the position of a particle from here to here say as a consequence the conformation is also changing right and you accept that with e to the minus delta e by kbt and if delta e is uh, negative if there's a the motion is such that there's a net decrease in energy always accept the conformation change okay now <clears throat> Now, delta E, as I already told, can be due to bead overlap or length in spring, uh, uh, change in length of the spring, right? Uh, KBT is, of course, the thermal energy. It's, of course, the thermal energy. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so, at the moment, in the simplest bead spring mo model, no other interaction is considered. But, of course, you can add other interactions as and when needed when we want to discuss uh, more complicated scenarios so the hamiltonian of the system would be half kappa r r uh, so actually there should be a summation time uh, summation sig uh, sign but suppose you are just considering two 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 beads then uh, r is the distance between the centers of the two monomers that is r and r minus a whole square a is the mean length of the spring right and h equal to by the way you guys are there right once the class had got disconnected i hope yeah. yes sir yeah okay So, uh, so basically what I'm saying is the Hamiltonian, there should be a summation sign, uh, sum over all springs. Uh, and so this is kappa, the spring constant, R minus A. A is suppose the mean length of the spring, suppose you take it to be one. So if R is greater than uh, one or less than one, then uh, there would be a contribution to the energy, the half kappa R minus A whole square. Uh, and the 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 overlap the repulsion between the beads if they overlap is modeled by the so-called leonard jones interaction or the wca interaction and that has the form like this like four epsilon sigma by r to the power 12 minus sigma by r to the power 6. so i will discuss why and how this potential actually helps in uh, modeling uh, the repulsion if two particles overlap on top of each other but before that how does this potential uh, th that i'll talk at the end but let me tell you a bit more about how monte carlo works and i'll also show you some movies about how a chain would take different uh, Confirmations. Maybe I should show you the movie first so that you have a visual picture of what I am talking, these different conformations and so on and so forth. So these uh, movies are actually not done using off lattice Monte Carlo. They are done using some other technique called the Lajva dynamics. But even if you did uh, using off lattice Monte Carlo, it would look, no, this is not teaching, uh, it would look very similar. So here on my page, uh, in my students' page here, there are some movies. Uh, is your basically fifth year student, and this is how it would look. So here, uh, we I had uh, or my student had placed some monomers. There are hundred monomers, and uh, and this is supposed to represent a polymer chain, and you see that these monomers are all diffusing and moving around in space as a consequence of which this polymer is constantly changing conformation right so each bead is moving around but held together by a spring 
so that the average distance between these monomers fluctuates around 1 or whatever is the bond length. In this case, we have set it to 1. So th th this is what, so this is done using larva, but if you even did off lattice Monte Carlo, it would look very similar. You won't be able to tell the difference. And here, and the question is, how would you do it? I have already told you a bit about how we do it. And here you see these different, all these different conformations correspond to different microstate. But this is one object and you, you have 100 particles connected by spring, so whatever. 3 plus 99 into 2 degrees of freedom. So, and it keeps on changing all possible conformations, right? Now, now I'll show you. Now, you see that this is just changing conformations. But if I had put, suppose, flexible polymer, 100 monomers, but we have four chains. And I put them in the middle of a box initially. Or my student put them in the uh, middle of a box. Right? Now, just to start, it was right at the beginning. And now what you see that the polymers are not only changing all sorts of conformation, but as you will gradually see, they're also moving apart from each other. Why are they moving apart from each other? Because if this polymer, this uh, pink one, uh, when it uh, when it collides with the monomers of the yellow one or the blue one, then it starts to basically diffuse away. Because if it is away from each other, then it can take the maximum number of conformations. If it is overlapping with some other polymer, then some of the conformations are restricted because of the presence of other monomers. And hence, these polymers, as you will see, are gradually diffusing away from each other. And after it has diffused away, it will keep on doing Brownian motion in terms of the center of mass. And different conformations, you see, they are slowly, gradually diffusing away. So the center of mass is also diffusing away, doing random motion. And other than that, each polymer is taking all possible conformations one after the other, right? And the conformation of this is, of course, very different from this. And this has a completely different conformation. But conformations are constantly changing as a function of time. And each is uh, 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 accessing different microstates. Is so this is the this is the basic. Now. Here, here we were considering. Here we were considering uh, flexible polymer chains, only bead and spring. But suppose you wanted to model some rigid uh, chain, like the DNA. Okay, where you don't want to consider all those chemistry, but you want to basically consider a stiff chain. So then, what you would have. then you would have to incorporate uh, a bending potential also so that there's an energy cost for bending. And here, so it again started where uh, it was coiled, but here you see that over a certain distance, it's basically stiff. It's remaining, it is changing all sorts of shapes. It's taking all possible conformations, but it cannot take as many conformations as was possible for the flexible chain. Why? Because over a certain length, over a certain length of the chain, it is trying to remain straight. Right? So, I mean, so there's a bending energy cost. Still, it can higher. So here, when it bends, there is an energy cost for that as well. In the simple bead spring model, uh, uh, which was, was being discussed in the lecture, there was no energy cost for bending. Here, there's an energy cost for overlap, there's an energy cost for increase of length of the spring, and there is an energy cost for uh, for bending. So higher energy microstates, uh, 
chain, uh, 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 chain with more bends is basically a higher energy microstate it is less accessible but over a certain length as you see over a certain length it behaves as a flexible chain over this certain length okay this one is coming because there is periodic boundary conditions so over this if you look at this over this length you see it is to be a stiff chain but if you look over suppose uh, this length then over a much larger length it has bent it, 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 it because uh, each bond has bent a bit and over a certain longer distance this information of that this chain was uh, straight is being lost because each each bond has bent a bit and over a much longer distance the whole chain has bent but of course it's not as flexible it, it can't take as many conformations as the flexible chain could take right so here i have dressed it up by an extra interaction the bending energy interaction which we were not considering in the simple bead spring model so this is semi flexible semi flexible means there's an energy cost for bending right now going back so this is what i mean by taking different conformations as allowed by the energy now going back so you have this term spring and this uh, this potential term prevents overlap of uh, overlap of monomers and i shall discuss this now remember when we are considering a spherical bead right uh, inside this bead now suppose you wanted to model a dna i actually do model dna but uh, using a bead spring model now suppose each of this bead was representing 9.2 kilo base pairs of uh, dna then inside the bead so this is supposed to be this double stranded dna and there are various proteins histone like proteins and mukbef like proteins whatever be there so all of those are inside the bead so all these details when you are doing the bead spring model all the chemistry details all the microscopic details all that is lost because you are replacing so many of these uh, base pairs and double helix and whatever is there inside you are replacing it by a sphere and you are looking at the properties of this long chain molecule rather than all the gory details which you are putting inside the sphere so all this information no other details are being considered right if you want to replace if you want to model a dna by a bead spring model then this double helix proteins all the various complexities that is there that will all be lost or if you want it then you have to add other interactions to incorporate those effects to a bead spring model so there is no resolution below the bead size so all that you have so suppose this bead was representing 9.2 9.2 because uh, basically for whatever reasons i uh, model the e coli dna which is 4.6 uh, million base pairs by 500 monomers and uh, 500 monomers and it's a ring polymer ring polymer means uh, there are no two free ends the two ends of the chain are connected again and that's how a bacterial DNA is supposed to be. They are ring polymers. And I use entropic physics. Uh, we'll talk about it. And uh, so if I replace the bacterial DNA, 5.4.6 uh, million base pairs by 500 monomers, then basically each bead represents 9.2 kilo base pairs, if you do this conversion. And we are losing out on all the microscopic details which is uh, all the biology all the physics all the chemistry which is happening at uh, scales uh, smaller than 9.2 kilo base pairs all that is lost now now you might know that the persistence length of dna persistence length is the length over which the chain uh, can be considered stiff uh, it, 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 it will basically behave 
almost like a rod. It's the length scale over which a, uh, the DNA will behave almost like a rod and without uh, proteins and so on. If it's a naked DNA, the persistence length of DNA is around 50 nanometers or 150 base pairs. So if I was looking at the DNA at a length scale uh, uh, below 50 nanometers or around 100 nanometers, then I cannot model this by a flexible chain. I have to incorporate stiffness into account, uh, um, like the one I showed you, the, the stiff chain. On the other hand, if each bead is 9.2 kilo base pairs, which is much larger than this 150 base pairs, so within this, there would be a lot of, uh, you know, it would be stiff and so on and so forth. But if you are looking at length scales at a much larger length scale, like when I was showing you that movie, when if your monomer, each monomer itself was suppose uh, 20 of those. Just one second. So here you have four stiff polymers. Now, so these now suppose you were looking at a length scale much larger. So suppose this was replaced as one monomer, right? Then at that length scale, you can consider it to be a flexible polymer. Now, if you are looking at long length scales, you can consider it to be a flexible polymer because all the bending and protein etc is happening at lower length scales right so so in that sense so in that sense if our bead is around uh, suppose DNA gene drawings are often worked on by many professionals from different devices and locations this makes So if I am looking at where one B represents 9.2 kilo base pairs, which is much larger than the persistence length of the DNA, I can consider it to be a flexible polymer, but not if I was looking at uh, physics at the length scale of 100 nanometers, see. Hence, uh, it's, it, it's valid. Now, now, how do we do uh, how do we create all those conformations? Now I'm going into the Monte Carlo details. You can either take a cubic box with PBC as I showed in the movies, or what you could also do is suppose um, take it in a cylinder, confine it in a cylinder corresponding to a bacterial cell. And what we do is at each Monte Carlo step, we choose a monomer one at a time at random using a random number generator. In the Ising model, what do you do? You choose a spin one at a time at random using a random number generator. In off-lattice Monte Carlo, what we are doing is choosing a monomer one at a time at random using a random number generator. And after choosing a random monomer, in Ising model, you give it a flip because that's the only degree of freedom which is allowed. It can either point up or down. On the other hand, here the monomers can occupy different points in space. And hence, here after choosing a random mon monomer at random, we give it a random displacement. And this we do for all the monomers one by one, choosing monomers at a random. In Ising model, what we what we, did we do? We chose all the spins at a random. And if you choose n spins and give it a random flip, you call it a Monte Carlo step. Here, in one Monte Carlo step, you choose if there are n monomers, you choose n. I mean, you choose a monomer one one monomer at a time, and you do that n times and give it a random displacement. And once you have done it for all monomers, or rather n monomers, 
and the n monomers in the chain then you call that a monte carlo step so suppose this was a polymer chain you choose this monomer at a random and give it a random displacement so that it has moved from here to here and now once it has moved from here to here so that the conformation as a consequence of this the conformation has changed from like this to like this say then you calculate the energy when the conformation was like this and calculate the energy when the conformation was like this and basically calculate the spring energies check whether there is an overlap or not and then you do the and if energy decreases because of this change in position you accept the move and if the energy increases you accept that move with probability e to the power minus delta e e for energy by kbt now i would like you to appreciate that if this black if this black chain was the conformation before a, Mo a monte carlo step then after a few monte carlo steps some of these monomers you are attempting a random displacement some of those will be accepted some of them won't be accepted as a consequence after one or two monte carlo steps this chain which was in black will have a slightly different conformation corresponding to this blue chain so some of the monomers will remain the same so hence i have drawn the black and the blue uh, on top of each other whereas some other monomers have changed their position so uh, here they have changed the position here you have changed the uh, position but in some cases they remain the same like here uh, i have intentionally drawn them remain the same so since we are giving random displacements now we'll discuss uh, random displacements as well uh, okay so before this let's talk here so basically suppose this was a chain you have given a random displacement now random uh, displacement can be in a random you have to first choose a random monomer then displace it in a random direction delta x delta y delta z uh, in any direction right so you choose a random value of delta x random value of delta y uh, and delta z so it can be in the plus or minus but you don't choose any magnitude because if you take this monomer and suddenly place it here that would be weird first of all this chain this this spring will get extremely stretched so you choose any random direction with a rand with a displacement any value between plus and minus delta so you can choose a delta x between plus delta and minus delta how using random numbers now suppose you choose delta to be 0.2 a where a is the bond length is the spring length if you like right so you can choose a monomer and give it a displacement a maximum of delta maximum means you take a random number multiply it by delta then you will get a random number between minus delta and plus delta that is what you already learned in the random walk case right so when we are doing that practice problem so so that you are going to use now here so if you choose delta x some random number between plus delta and minus delta and suppose delta is 0.2 you choose a random number suppose you get 0.15 and then you choose a delta y and that might be minus 0.03 and then you choose a delta of uh, z a, a displacement in the z direction that could be suppose 0.18 uh, no, not 0 0.18 and then your net displacement is delta x square plus delta y square plus delta z square so this monomer could go up and become like this right now if that increases the energy you accept it with probability e to the power minus delta e by kbt if it decreases the energy then you always accept it and in the next step maybe 
you uh, take some uh, take this monomer and put it down suppose it has a random displacement in this direction so that the conformation becomes like this right again you do the so you're taking a random monomer giving it a random displacement in a random direction in a random magnitude up to a maximum of delta you don't choose delta to be very high because then the spring length will uh, will be forced to change a lot and that step won't be accepted right now now so though i have drawn it like this the actual picture that you should have is that each bead if the spring length was suppose a equal to one and you have bead of diameter 0 0.8 or radius being 0 0.4 the so diameter being 0 0.8 so then between two springs you have two spheres sitting like this now the spring is virtual it's just a potential it's not that there's a metallic spring this is actually sitting there right it's just in terms of a potential and similarly these beads is basically if i mean if two beads overlap then it will feel a potential and move apart right now so so there will be two spheres like this radius of 0 0.4 0 0.4 and this distance in that case will be 0 0.2 now the spring can also fluctuate now, as these monomers are moving around in random directions, because they are going random displacements, that is very much like Brownian motion or diffusive motion. What is diffusive motion? A monomer is a particle is doing a random uh, diffusive motion, it's doing Brownian motion. So that's essentially diffusive motion. And in this case, if a uh, another suppose uh, so there was another uh, bead which basically came and overlapped with each other it wouldn't be able to pass through this chain and chain crossing won't be allowed but if we chose suppose smaller spheres if we chose instead of diameter of 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.8 if you chose diameter of suppose uh, 0.2 or 0.3 okay so then what would the picture be it will be what you see in this black chain so, so see this is a small sphere there's much more space this is suppose diameter of 0.3 diameter of uh, 0.3 so 0 0.15 0 0.15 and there's a lot of space between now this is a chain like this and then this part this monomer could actually sit in between these two monomers yeah because the spring is not this is not a metallic spring it is just in terms of interaction in reality here there is this vacant space but this monomer and this monomer is maintained at a distance of approximately one with fluctuations because the spring can stretch a bit or compress a bit and in this case a bead a bead can actually pass through another bead or chain crossing would so basically what i was saying is these springs are not real though the, the effect of the springs are real they and they just hope to maintain distance between the beads and the distance between the beads can be a the bead uh, the, the the spring length plus minus delta a note i'm not writing del this delta because there can be multiple steps and springs can stretch more than delta finally right so if we have smaller spheres then chain crossing is allowed now in a real synthetic polymer chain uh, um, you never have chain crossing in reality because there are bonds but in biological po uh, polymers in dna chain crossing is allowed because uh, there's some protein called uh, topoisomerase and that actually cuts the bond allows the chain to pass through constraint is released and then it attaches back the chain and if i wanted to model chain crossing and have entropic effects then i could choose these uh, spheres to be smaller and this would automatically allow chain crossing uh, to take place right i mean uh, as as you would be mimic the biological system but of course you would also need uh, the excluded volume excluded volume that uh, this 
the volume occupied this bead by this bead is not you, you don't allow any other monomer or any other bead to occupy the same volume as this one so that is called excluded volume okay now if you have bigger beads then chain crossing is not allowed if you have smaller beads chain crossing is allowed you could also do that for most of the time you have a large bead but that rare intervals you decrease the size of the bead which allows chain crossing and constraint release so that's actually what i do when i want to model dna now the a question is how much would it be delta a delta a is how much can the springs fluctuate okay because you're using statistical me mechanics so you're going to use equipartition theorem so if you say uh, basically for each spring half kappa r minus a whole square is the spring energy of each spring okay and if you chose kappa to be 100 kbt then uh, basically half kappa delta a whole square the mean uh, mean delta a whole square uh, well it wouldn't be actually 3 by 2 kbt you are just looking at one degree of freedom the length of the spring so this would be uh, half kbt so 100 delta a whole square equal to kbt using equipartition theorem and delta a the average fluctuation in length of the spring right delta a whole square kbt if you choose to be one or you measure all other energies in units of kbt uh, so basically kappa is 100 times kbt suppose then delta a would be one tenth or basically the average stretching of the spring due to thermal fluctuations yeah because if it stretches why is it able to stretch it is able to access a high energy microstate as per statistical physics right so the increase in bond length uh, can easily be up to 10 percent that's the standard deviation it's this mean you i'm, I'm using equipartition now, of course it can go up to 0 0.2 as well i mean it can go up to you do have higher energy microstates but the mean stretching or compression is around 10 percent if you choose kappa to be 100 of course if you choose uh, kappa to be 1000 then this delta a would be only one percent it will be one by 100 right but again using equipartition theorem so if you want a stiff spring then the fluctuation in length would be much less and that you can control by choosing different values of kappa that's the interaction energy and that will tell you how much fluctuation in spring is allowed so what is the message so by virtue of random displacement you are moving each monomer at a time choosing a monomer at random giving it a random displacement by that you are modeling diffusive motion of each of these monomers subject to the constraint of no overlap between particles and spring length can fluctuate only uh, as decided by kappa so by virtue of random displacement a spring can get stretched the energy of spring or a polymer can increase and the polymer conformation can access higher energy microstates or conformation so if this was a polymer conformation due to a random displacement what could happen is there could be a slight overlap between this red and the blue one and in the next monte carlo attempt this red particle this red particle could move away because if there is an overlap that would cost energy there would be a higher energy cost right so low energy conformations are more probable as per statistical mechanics than higher energy conformations higher energy conformations would have compressed or stretched spring or beads with overlap but still high energy conformations or microstates are still access those are possible those are not impossible conformations as allowed by kbt as a, it's a finally a play it, it's a play between uh, between how many how much higher energy microstates can be accessed that depends upon the competition between the potential energy and kbt 
So if you increase KBT, more and more higher energy conformations will be accessed easily as statistical physics. So whatever you are learning in statistical physics one, this is a visual implementation of various microscopes being accessed. So you hear by simulations, you can actually visualize uh, statistical th physics at work because it's very difficult to imagine all these microstates and so on and so forth right whereas here you could actually see different conformations for a for a stiff polymer and a flexible polymer so here you could actually see statistical and you could see that the various polymers were moving away they were diffusing away because they were colliding with each other because there were the collisions, they would move away from each other so that they can access the maximum conformations, right? And all that is at play is e to the power eh by kBT, which is the Boltzmann factor. Higher energy conformations are less probable to be accessed, but not impossible. They are accessed. Higher energy conformations are accessed, still accessed with a lower probability. That's all that is there. And so, and if there's an overlap, of course, uh, in the next uh, few random uh, displacement attempts, a uh, particle will move so that there's no overlap because that will decrease the energy. As I have already said, different conformations lead to different, uh, co correspond to different microstates. And the more microstates are being explored, there is more entropic effect. So basically, in 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 the canonical ensemble if you have read about cano if you have been taught canonical ensemble f equal to u minus ts u is the potential energy and x and if there is more temperature then more and more microstates will be accessed so free energy can be can decrease by minimization of u or maximization or accessing more microstates and uh, since it comes with a negative sign, you can also have free energy minimization under a different condition so that larger number of microstates are accessed. And that is exactly what you are seeing even in your I Ising model. It's basically again a competition between U and minus Ts and you are modeling canonical ensemble in your Ising model simulation. Now sometimes you can have very strange effects and so entropy at play. Now, now, what I do is uh, basically take two overlapping polymers, they are ring polymers, and I put them in a cylinder, compactify in a cylinder. And now all these uh, polymer chains, this red one and the blue one, tries to take all possible conformations, just as you saw. Except now they are confined in a cylinder. Now, because of this, as they try to as they try to take all possible conformations, they would try to maximize the number of conformations that is possible. And as a consequence, these polymers would automatically segregate into two halves of the cylinder. Okay, so that one half of the cylinder will be occupied by the blue chain and the other half of the cylinder will be occupied by the red chain. Why is this happening? Because if they separate out the number of conformations that they can take is more than the number of conformations that they can take if they were overlapping. The, all the monomers are diffusing and all locally what is happening, each monomer is trying to do a random displacement. By virtue of its random displacements, it is trying to access different conformations. Now, the number of conformations that the polymer can take if uh, they are overlapping is fewer than the number of conformations that they can take if they separate out. Okay, though half of the, uh, so this polymer, uh, half of the cylinder is not accessible to it. Similarly to this red one, half of the cylinder is not accessible. But still the number of conformations they can take because here they would collide with the other uh, other uh, so the red monomers would collide with the blue monomers so red and blue is just for communicating to you they would segregate into two halves of the cylinder so they're in some sense getting more arranged but the but the undercoat force or the drive i don't want to use the word, word force the drive 
for this organization or this separation is coming from entropy. Now, it typically you associate entropy would, uh, would drive more mixing or more chaotic states. Here, to maximize entropy, the polymers are actually segregating to two halves of the cylinder. And in fact, uh, so now I want to give you an example coming from, uh, so th th this is just Monte Carlo, can be done using Monte Carlo simulation. And some of uh, these movies are also there on my website. Now you might, uh, if you have studied your uh, first two years and if you had biology, then you know that for higher organisms like humans and mammals and insects and so on and so forth, uh, there is a complicated machinery which separates the DNA uh, when a DNA is being copied or a cell is being copied. But for simpler organisms like bacteria, there is no huge, uh, no mitotic spindle which separates out the DNA. And in fact, since 2006, uh, by some work of some physicists, it is now fairly accepted that in bacteria equally, which is one of the more primitive organisms, the bacteria uses entropic forces to segregate out its DNA into two parts of the cell before the cell undergoes cell division. So basically, the E. coli, of course, the E. coli, the DNA is a dead object, but it is after all undergoing Brownian motion inside the cell. And the E. coli, it's fairly accepted. It's there in the review papers. I don't know whether it's there in the books that E. coli and many, uh, uses essentially entropic forces, entropic drive this principle to separate out its DNA to two halves of the cell before the cell divides into two. And that can be visualized and seen uh, using Monte Carlo simulation. And there are videos of that on my website. Of course, I'm doing beyond this. This was proposed in 2006, but I am working beyond it. But I had to first reproduce this standard result of two polymers segregating out into two parts of the cell. Right, and I have done it using Monte Carlo simulations. So I'm using physics and entropic physics and Monte Carlo simulations to even understand DNA segregation because I have not put no, no other protein, uh, I have put no other biology in the system except the physics of what I told you, and that leads to segregation of DNA. Right, uh, I actually am working with uh, um, uh, not only ring polymers but ring polymers with extra architectures. So, basically, I have a ring polymer where I have put some extra cross link, extra constraints. If you are talking the language of physics, then I'm putting in uh, an extra constraint so that now there are uh, instead of one big loop, there are three such loops. And uh, for the reasons that I told you just previously, this loop will repel this loop because if they are away from each other, uh, then they can take more conformations. But these two loops will also in turn repel this bigger loop. And the repulsion between this loop, this loop, and this bigger loop is more, right? And all that you do is take random steps in random directions, diffusive motion by Monte Carlo simulations, right? Or flattest Monte Carlo simulations. And as a consequence of which, if you have two such uh, replicated DNA, they would arrange themselves so that these two small loops are close together, though they are repelling each other, but their mutual repulsion between this and this bigger loop is more. But of course, at times, this blue loop can, while changing all possible conformations, can also sit like this so that it has crossed over a bit like this. But overall, these they will arrange themselves so that these two loops are in one region, this big loop is in another region. Now this black loop and this black loop will again repel each other. So they will basically arrange themselves in a linear fashion. Just one second. So they would arrange themselves in a linear fashion in this manner, right? Uh, so the last topic which I want to talk about is the uh, basically how do I model this excluded volume interaction so that two beads don't 
certain top of each other. This is discussed in greater detail in the molecular dynamics, which is the last module of the course. But here, uh, I'm just telling you in brief, just for the sake of completion, because this is discussed in much greater detail in the molecular dynamics. But just to give you a picture, so the V of R, the potential of interaction, uh, is uh, 4 epsilon. I shall tell you what that is in sigma by R to the power 12. So this is a repulsive potential. This is a repulsive potential. And this is an attractive potential. This comes with a minus sign, sigma by R to the power 6. And if you plot it, this potential looks, so this is V of R, I'm extremely sorry. This is a, I should have uh, marked V of R here. And this is R, the X axis is R. And the Y axis is V of R. Uh, so I've plotted the potential as a function of R. And V of R looks like this. So there's a minima like this. This is the repulsive part at small r. Uh, this term dominates over this term yeah, because this is to the power 12. So, and so sigma by r to the power 12, so it, it dominates over this term um, when r is small. So it's a very sharply rising repulsive potential. Whereas for larger r, this term dominates uh, more. Okay. So as a consequence, there's a potential minima. And the depth of this potential is this epsilon. If you calculate dvdr, uh, uh, what is the uh, equal to zero? Where, where is the potential minima? You calculate that r, and that is approximately two to the power uh, not approximately. It is exactly equal to two to the power one by six sigma. Sigma being the diameter, the diameter of the two particles. So, so basically, if these two particles touch each other, the distance between the monomers is sigma. Yeah, if, the, if r equal to sigma, then the potential would be zero here. It is this point. Sorry, it is this point. The potential is zero, but the force is not zero. Remember, the force is dv dr, right? And if the if one of the monomers makes a random motion so that the r is even less than sigma, so if the distance between is like this, then it will face a very steep potential the energy increase in that delta e by kbt will be extremely high so overlap will be prevented on the other hand if you plot just this potential then at distances of 1.1 to sigma there is a attraction now i haven't talked about an attraction i know about that but that is how the leonard jones potential looks like sigma by r to the power 6 here it is one point, uh, 2 to the power 1 by 6 is actually 1.12 sigma. So the potential minima is somewhere here and the depth of the potential is, uh, uh, is epsilon. So this is the depth of the potential. This is the amount of attraction it, it, it will feel, right? The reason it is written like 4 epsilon is if you write it like this, then the depth of the potential exactly will be. Uh, epsilon. If you write just epsilon here, then the depth of the potential will be one fourth epsilon. Now, now this is a valid uh, weak attraction at small, slightly larger distances beyond the overlap. That is a valid model for uh, say argon gas. But suppose we don't want that. Then what we could do is take a cut off. You cut the potential off here. Okay, at the minima and shift it up. So suppose this was your Leonard Jones potential. You cut off the potential because we don't uh, and shift it. If you don't shift it, by the way, note that there is a discontinuity in the potential. That is not something which you want. And of course, in MD, you will also try to remove the discontinuity in the force, but we'll leave that. So there's a discontinuity in the potential. So you cut the potential off and shift it up. And in that case, you have only a purely repulsive potential if the distance between two monomers becomes less than 1.12 sigma. If the, if the distance between two monomers becomes something like this, then it will feel a repulsive potential. If uh, there's a random displacement so that the distance between two monomers becomes less than 1.12 to the power 1 by 6 sigma, then 
the energy will increase. Such a random step will not be accepted in the Monte Carlo move or it will be accepted provided KBT allows. And once you cut the potential and shift it up, uh, you take the Leonard Jones potential, you cut it and shift it up suitably, then uh, it is called the weak, uh, weak Chandler Anderson potential. It is basically a suitably cut and shifted Leonard Jones potential, and then it is only a repulsive interaction. Yeah, so we were talking about these monomers which interact only through pure repulsion, and it's a purely repulsive interaction, and that's the weak Chandler Anderson. And you can prevent bead overlap by using the bead by using the WCA interaction. On the other hand, if you want some weak attraction between the beads, then you could as well use the Leonard Jones interaction. If you want uh, also suppose charged polymers, DNA often is charged, then you put in charge over and above these interactions. If you want semi flexibility, if you want to model a stiff chain, then you put in a bending uh, interaction. If you want other interactions, you keep adding to the Hamiltonian and with that, Every time you do a random step or a random uh, motion displacement for the monomer, you have to calculate all these energies and the difference in energy in one configuration to the other. And that's how you do a off lattice Monte Carlo. So that's all that I have to say. Uh, now, where did it go? Ah, it's here. So that's all uh, that uh, stop sharing. Uh, now, if you have any questions, let me know as we break for today. Okay. Any questions? Okay. But anyway, this is just for your knowledge if you are interested. If not, it's perfectly fine. You don't have to implement it. But I hope this will give you a better understanding of the uh, even the Monte Carlo lattice, uh, lattice Monte Carlo that you're doing for eigenstates. Okay, so I'll stop recording and bye.